You are listening to Power Marketing with Kevin Lee. Kevin and his agency Did It have helped thousands of businesses win through superior marketing, as have his books, articles, speaking engagements, and the eMarketing Association Power Marketing Podcasts. Here's Kevin. I'm here today with Jim McCarthy, who wears several hats, uh, both as an educator and as the founder of a couple of events companies, Gold Star Events, uh, and then a spinoff, uh, Stella Live. And he's also active in the nonprofit community, in particular, uh, a playhouse, but there may be even more. So Jim, I'd love for you to self-introduce and start by telling the backstory for uh, Gold Star and then how Stellar uh, became a spin out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to be here. Uh, let's see. Gold Star was founded in 2002. And that was really something that came together with two uh, friends of mine who are the co-founders of Gold Star, still involved today. Um, and, you know, we just saw that the internet was bringing something new to the world of event marketing, specifically live entertainment event marketing. That, that wasn't there before, which was a timely and personalized kind of marketing. It was very difficult, very difficult or impossible in 2002 to customize a marketing message quickly or at all to uh, an audience of people that had raised their hand and said, I'm interested in finding out about more events. But we knew that the internet provided the ability to mass customize in that way. And Really, we we just saw it as we were we were guys who had been in the internet business for several years, been in e-commerce, and we just knew what the internet could do. We didn't really know much about live entertainment at the time. And so that was really the thing that we that was the gap we had to fill ourselves was okay, let's go learn about this industry. And so, you know, these many years later, um, at a very at the very least, I think we've done that. And along the way, I think we've sold about a billion dollars worth of tickets for our organizer partners around the, around the country. And um, I did uh, the last time I looked 2 million shows, I think right, right around 2 million shows. I don't know how many, how many tickets that translates into, but anyway, um, that, that a lot of people are familiar with what gold star does. They're signed up for emails or they've downloaded the app, but you know, it's just been this process of trying to find and work with all the best um, creators of live entertainment all over the country. Um, which is all fine and good, of course, until last March, when all of a sudden that whole business came, as you know, to a complete stop. So yeah. do, do the, the bands and venues see you to some extent as a sort of mini nimble competitor, like a Ticketmaster? Well, we don't compete with Ticketmaster or other ticketing systems because we don't provide a ticketing system, right? We, we um, if the, regardless of what ticketing system somebody has, they can work with Gold Star. So the more accurate way to think of Gold Star is as a marketing channel. We have an audience. And so we've created this marketplace for people who want to sell tickets and people who want to find tickets. And what we've done, I think, better than almost anybody, in addition to the customization and I think service, but what one thing that we've done more than uh, better than almost anybody is discovery. Um, one of the biggest problems in, in live entertainment is that people don't know what's going on. And again, we're talking as though things are normal. So let's just pretend everything gets back to normal or when people are watching this, everything's back to normal. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, over the years, I've been able to do this over and over and over again. I'll ask somebody, name three things that are happening in your city, you know, this weekend. And rarely can anyone name more than one, <laughs> you know. And this is in an environment where there's literally hundreds of interesting, exciting things happening. And so it's kind of like, you know, well, why is that? You know, and a part of it is it's hard to know, right? How do you, how do you get the relevant information? How do you get um, to find out the stuff that really matters to you? And so Gold Star has been super successful and we got emulated many, 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 many times over by all kinds of people, big and small, but we were there before everybody else. Uh, but we've been very successful at um, helping people find out what's going on in their, in their city and, and, going and getting it, getting a discount, going to the event, buying it, enjoying it, becoming a fan of, of that show or that venue or whatever. And so, you know, not, nothing's better. Like, I think it's one thing to, uh, to, to get a good ticket for a show that you know that you like. That's great. That's a good thing. But even better than that is finding out about something that you didn't know existed and it, and you like it or you love it. That to me is at a, a higher plane of value because, if I, if, you know, imagine there's something out there that's just perfect for you, Kevin. You just like, 
absolutely would love it. It would change your life. It would be en enriching and exciting. You'd have a great time, but then you never knew about it. Like how big of a bummer is that, right? So this is what I, I think I'm the proudest of about what Gold Star has done is we've helped people discover all kinds of great stuff. And, and in the same way that, uh, you know, some of the music apps uh, are attempting to use AI to sort of guess, make yeah. take their best guess of what other band you might like uh, to listen to. Yeah. Uh, have you evolved your sort of matching algorithm to make best guesses of, from an event space yeah. of what the person might like? The first, we are the first company that ever used an algorithm to present you with events. So that was all the way back in 2005. So I, I stake the claim for Gold Star on that. We we did that long before. It wasn't super sophisticated. It wasn't any more sophisticated than sort of Amazon's recommendation engine algorithm, but it was very much like that. And the way that kind of thing works is actually takes, uh, it, it's it's simple in a way. The math is complex and the the you know the programming of it is complex, but the concept is simple, which is it looks at let, let's say you've you've bought or 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 looked at event A, B, C, and D, you know, and there are other people out there in a cluster that 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 did the same thing, A, B, C, and D, and then they did E. The the basic idea of an of a recommendation engine like the one we used back in 2005 and the one that, that Amazon has used is to say, well, what do you think about E? You know, because we see you being very similar to these other people who went from A, B, C, and D to E. And so, hey, maybe you like E as well. And then over time, you know, we we eventually back in 2018, we we actually rebuilt from scratch the algorithm. It's a thing called Matchmaker. It's it's actually far more complex than that. I, I don't think philosophically it's totally different from that idea of putting everybody's information together and and seeing if we can make a recommendation. But we built a new product called Matchmaker. We won an award in 2019 for it because so it just kind of takes it to the next level of being able to, to be effective and predictive. And so I, I think we're better than anything I've seen in the live entertainment business on that. Um, it's another thing. I think what you're talking about is apps like Bands in Town, where they scan your, your library, your, your iTunes library or Spotify playlists or whatever. And they say, okay, you probably like this music. I think that's valuable too. Um, what we do is go really directly to the events themselves. We go across genres and we go directly to the events themselves and, and present it that way. Great, great. Well, it seems like uh, at the consumer level, uh, in the end, right, uh, unless money changes hands, um, you don't have a business. And at the consumer level, it seems like you're really providing a valuable service in that matchmaking. Um, how did that end up being the catalyst for Stellar Live? Obviously, I, you were already probably thinking about hybridization of events and, and, and other factors before the pandemic. Or was the pandemic the catalyst? For the pandemic was really the catalyst to action. We, we've been talking, I don't know if you know this, but I am the co-organizer of TEDx Broadway, which is TEDx event. What do you, what do you know, based in Broadway? Um, and so we've been talking about it from the stage of TEDx Broadway since 2012. The very first TEDx Broadway, we, we had a, a speaker who talked about hybrid events. Um, um, and then we made a small investment in a company that was a little early, but did the sort of online concert thing back in 2014, I think it was. And uh, so we've been thoughtful about it for a long time, but just like everybody else, I think nobody really said, okay, well, nobody, uh, some did, that's not fair, but most people didn't really say like, well, I'm going to put some chips on the table and try to make this function, you know, as, a, as an industry to make online events happen um, until the pandemic came along. And I think oftentimes the sort of um, crisis stimulant is what it's, what it needs, what thing, what, what, what's needed to, to take things from the realm of the possible to the realm of the, the real, you know? And so that's definitely uh, what happened. We, we saw people, we saw our organizers last summer, summer of 2020, or spring even, um, doing these online events and trying to find a way to build an audience and to be successful in a different medium. And we saw that there were a lot of gaps to what was being delivered, not so much in the content, although there was that too, but everything that you needed to do in order to be successful in online events, people were really having to improvise. And so we built Stellar as a way for people to be able to do great online events, both on the video delivery, audio delivery, but also on the ticket security, just the whole thing, making it one integrated package. So it very much was um, 
a reaction to the needs of the people that we were working with, but also the opportunity that's in front of us. I'm, I'm convinced that in five years, in five years, everyone in live entertainment will either be doing online or hybrid events or chasing the people who've gotten good at it because it's just too big of an advantage, right? If you really yeah. figure out how to do it, it's a, it's a huge advantage. Yeah, it's absolutely a huge advantage. And, and, you know, uh, to take things into the marketing realm more, uh, obviously you help uh, current event owners market their events, right? Because you, yeah. you've got that captured, that captured audience. So that's super powerful, but a lot of event producers also rely on sponsors, right? And when it was sponsored in person events, they had these sort of packages that the sponsors could buy, whether it was signage or, you know, uh, acknowledgement that the free drink kit ticket was sponsored by this person or whatever, right? Uh, and so, you know, there's sort of a long history of sponsorship of in-person events. And, and now that the events are sort of moving hybrid or, or fully virtual, uh, where do you think the opportunity lies for, for the sponsors? Like, how should they rethink the way in which they, um, you know, they're sponsoring events. Are they going to sort of rely more on like live shout outs from the band or the entertainer? Uh, you know, are they going to look for sort of digital signage? You know, what are the opportunities there? Yeah, I think that actually the sponsorship opportunities for online or the online component of an event is better be because you have a, a lot more, I guess, ways to connect with people so that I, I've always thought in-person sponsorships are fine, but easy to ignore, right? If Budweiser has signs all over the Staples Center, I'm not sure if they do, but that sounds like something that would really happen, right? Um, you know, first of all, the concert, you're not going to get a shout out from the stage, you know, because you're the sponsor of the stage. That, that's not realistic, but okay. That's the kind of thing in-person sponsorships give you, right? And over the long term, there is value there, obviously, because people keep coming back and buying sponsorships for big dollars and in-person events. What you don't get that much is reach into the consumer or knowledge about what the consumer did, right? So there's a whole bunch of ways to, with online events that you can get exposure before the show starts that's very focused. You can find out um, in, of course, within the boundaries of what, what's legal and what's agreed by the consumer, you can, you can offer people things that they can opt into. You can reach them after the event if, that, if that's part of the deal. You, there's just a million ways that you can do it. And I actually think if, if someone, part of getting really good at the hybrid model is going to be the ability to sell sponsorships that cross that barrier between the in-person and, and the online. Um, which gives you the best of both worlds. I mean, the other thing about the online sponsorship, of course, is that it it's potentially limitless in scale, right? It could it could be reaching way more people um, over time than the number of people that come into the venue. So I think it's a big opportunity, and in some ways, a better opportunity than the in-person sponsorship. The other thing that I'd love your perspective on is uh, obviously for live events that hadn't been sort of simulcast through traditional broadcast, right? Uh, uh, it, there was sort of the idea that the event happened, it was at a specific slice of time, and then it was done and everybody so, sort of moved on with their lives. Right. Now, once you move hybrid, uh, obviously the majority of people will want that sort of specialness of having attended it live. But there's also the people who happen to be on vacation that week or on a business trip right. or at a con conflicting um, meeting. And so this idea that, you know, it, it becomes a piece of entertainment that's in the can, right, and has longevity afterwards. Yeah. What are the opportunities there? Do you think that that should automatically go up there sort of free content or freemium content? Do you think they should dice it up, make some of it free, make some of it sort of, uh, you know, uh, firewalled, so pay for play, like to get yeah. access to it after the fact? Well, I think the basic principle is that, um, you know, in the business of, of live entertainment or live event production in general, the basic, what I talk about is the one law of, of being successful with it is make great shows and charge people for them. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it is really that simple. And I think when we, when we started going down the path of online events, people kind of forgot that they forgot the make great shows part and they forgot to charge people for the part. And maybe that was related. I'm being a little uh, snarky, but in truth, it takes a great show to be able to charge somebody for it, but that's the job, right? That's the job of an event producer is to create something worth charging for. Yeah. I think there's freemium opportunities. I think there's free potential out there. I think you could have a very successful model 
where an online event was fully sponsored and it was free to the consumer and that could actually work out well potentially for the sponsor. Um, so I think there's a bunch of models in there, but I don't want people to get away from the core idea that people pay for good content. You know, I, I know there's a lot of free content, but everybody you know pays for all kinds of content on online. I mean, it's just the, people pay for, for good content in many, many ways, whether it's their Netflix subscription or, you know, the download of a movie or whatever it is. There's a lot of opportunities um, for people to express that. They, I mean, and, you know, if, if something's good enough, people pay more than, than you'd think, right? I mean, like, like this is just we, we see this behavior over and over again, right? So, it, it re- but it, what's really important is the, is the first part of that equation, which is when you create an online event, it can't be half-assed, you know, you know what I mean? It's gotta be good. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason I'm sort of smiling is I was thinking about your analogy of, you know, if it's great content, we'll, we'll, people will pay for it. And of course, in the news this last month and in particular today is OnlyFans because OnlyFans reversed its policy yeah. with regards to its content and yeah. what is still allowable on the platform. And that's certainly one form of content that if you put on a good show, people will pay for it. Well, I, 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 when the announcement came out the other day, I thought to myself that they were going to stop uh, doing the, the porn on the platform. I thought, well, that's the end of this company. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, oh, and simultaneously, I, th- I thought like the, there's a, clock ticking somewhere for when they reverse this right because um it, yeah i mean it, it i know it's it's a whole different kind of thing and and in some ways it's very important for people who are in the live event marketing business and are thinking about online events to push past the the politeness or ick factor of what they're doing is porn and realize that what they're doing is it's not just porn i mean you can't just put you know famously porn is a distressed business model now because of all the, 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 the free and stolen porn sites. There's, there's a lot of, it's really interesting, right? The porn people are always on the cutting edge of, of oh, someone's bringing me iced tea. The porn people are always on the cutting edge of, of the business model because um, they're just, you know, it's just the nature of that, of that part of the industry. But the point I'm making is if you're thinking about online content and you're thinking about monetizing online content, you should definitely be watching and thinking uh, about OnlyFans. Because it's not just a matter of putting, you know, n- nude whatever on the internet. Th- there's still got to be value creation, you know? And right. so somehow what OnlyFans has facilitated is for creators to create content that people are willing to pay for and pay for again and pay for again and pay for again. And it does, I mean, th- I think this is the core idea. You can do that outside of porn if, if, if you're committed to that idea that, you know, you can make content that, that's really worthwhile. And I, and I do think it's important for people to not allow the sort of polite society concerns of understanding what's happening with OnlyFans to stop them from seeing what this is, which is it a, it's like everything else. It's like, it's like video. It's like streaming video. The first people that did streaming video way back in the 90s were the porn people. And it was years later, several years later, when suddenly YouTube and all the other platforms facilitated it as the perhaps the biggest marketing tool of the last couple of decades, right? So there's a window of time where they kind of had the field to themselves. And I feel in a way that when it comes to online con- online event content, we're in that period right now. So from the point of view of, of someone who's a marketer or a content creator, it's the same, it's that same opportunity again. It's 1999 in, in, uh, in the streaming video world, you know? Um, and so it's definitely worth understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one thing that, that as I was thinking about the events business, um, to some extent, uh, you, you were assured in any particular city, particularly a metropolitan city, you, you were assured of sort of there being a limit to the amount of clutter of events because you were limited by the number of venues, yep. right? So yep. you, you, know, you had X number of venues for New York City, X number of venues in the, in the LA County, right? And so there couldn't be really more events of, of significant size beyond that. And to some extent that allowed the cream to rise to the top, right? Because the producers had to book the events and everybody had to get paid. And um, once you go virtual, obviously the barriers to entry sort of go away and, and there could be more clutter because now sort of 
who's to stop anybody from doing an event? Obviously, it may, may not be successful, but um, right. as you sort of think through this idea of curation, right? Yeah. If it's virtual only events and you want to make recommendations, um, you know, using your platform as you merge the two together and you sort of want to be sure it's going to be an event that rises to that, uh, that quality level. It used to be that sort of there was this built-in equilibrium because of the fact that, that you have to be paying for venues. So you had skin in the game right yeah. now. Uh, is that going away with virtual events or is it, is, is, is there still sort of a, an equilibrium or, or a new equilibrium with regards to virtual events? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I haven't thought about the specific answer, but I will say that, um, you know, doing a good online event is, is a little challenging. There's, there's aspects of it that are challenging. And the, when people do it well, the quality comes shining through in a way that distinguishes it from other stuff. Um, you know, at this point, I don't know why anybody goes to any event that's done on Zoom unless there's a really special reason for it. It's not because Zoom, there's anything wrong with Zoom. Zoom was not created as a show platform, right? It was created for conversations like this. Um, so, it, you know, when, when we've encountered people who put quality into a show, there's, there's a recognition of it, even in the, even in the marketing. And I think the marketing has to reflect it. Right. So I know this is about marketing. So let's talk about that. Right. Everything, you know, one, one of the, actually, this is a really interesting way of thinking about it. I've had this conversation I'm about to describe to you a few different times where I'll be talking to somebody in, a, in an organization that's sort of dabbling with online events. And I'll say, well, what are your plans on online events? And they say, well, we do some, but they don't really sell. I'm like, well, what have you done so far? Well, we did a few shows, um, you know, and, you know, it, it just didn't sell well. And I said, well, tell me how you approach the production of the show. Said, well, we didn't really put uh, a, a big budget behind it. And we didn't really market it that much because we wanted to see what people did. And I said, so what happened? They said, well, not many people came, not many people. And so from that, we deduced that online events don't sell. And I said, well, when you do in-person events, do you put a budget behind them? Do you market them? Well, yes, of course. Well, why do you put a production budget and a marketing budget behind those events? Because people respond to the quality of those events. And I said, well, doesn't it follow then that if you don't put a production budget and a marketing budget behind online events, they, they won't show up for those either? And they, and they say, no, but don't you see people don't buy online events? <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. You've got the causal arrow wrong, right? Yeah. Like they, they think that people don't buy online events and therefore they they kind of kneecap the online events. But in reality, it's the kneecapped events that don't sell. So there's different challenges. And I, and I really do think we are at early in, in the ev evolution of this market. But um, people love shows, right? Like there's, uh, there's a bottomless appetite out there for great content and people like live content, right? I mean, if, if there's something special enough, important enough to be live, um, they, they, they want it, they pay for it, they go to it. It's just that the challenges of getting around, how do I actually create something that is exciting, you know, to watch on the screen? That's something that a lot of people are learning now. Is there something to be, is there, are there some analogies between sort of those extra special sports that end up on pay-per-view and yeah. live in an arena, right? Because in that case, that content is so premium that you're paying either way, right? You're either paying to watch it as pay-per-view at home and you're oh you're watching and paying very high ticket prices, particularly high for front row or first three rows or whatever to attend that boxing event or that MMA event or whatever. Right. So That's should right. content producers for music and comedy and everything else sort of think about that? Like I have to make it special enough that people yeah. will expect to pay. Well, sometimes when I talk about uh, online events, I actually say, if that trips you up, if the terminology of online events trips you up, just think of it as pay-per-view. Right. But think of it as pay-per-view that's been democratized so that just about anybody could do one. And while you're thinking about pay-per-view, think about the fact that, you know, uh, if you look at the list of highest paid athletes in 2019 uh, in the world, there are a lot of names on that list that are people that I would consider extremely famous. You know, whether you're talking about Leo Messi or LeBron James or, you know, you know just, just really, really famous names. And of course, um, 
the you know the guy that I'm about to mention is also famous, but Canelo Alvarez, right? Are are you familiar with with him? Uh, many would not be familiar with him. He's a boxer. He's a successful boxer, but he was on the list way above LeBron, way above Aaron Rodgers, way above names that, especially in America, would be more familiar to people because Canelo is a boxer who fought twice in in 2019. And on the strength of those two fights, made more money than all, many of those other other guys who worked many more than two nights, right? Like it, it, he, and that's because of pay per view. Because the the you know in in the case of of major um, um, boxing matches or MMA matches or other things, you can have a million people buying at 50, 60, 70 uh or more a hundred dollars on on average even more than that you can have more i'm sorry not just a million you have multiple millions of people buying so floyd mayweather made 275 million dollars for a a single pay-per-view fight i think it was in 2017 so it's it's remarkable you know bts last october the korean uh, the k-pop band bts did nearly a million paid uh, admissions to their online show um which is remarkable. I mean, that's a that's a tour's worth of people uh, yeah. in a ninety minute show. So that possible. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't have to be BTS, right? Everyone, everyone out there is going like, yeah, but I, I'm not BTS. Yeah, I know. Uh, but you know, nonetheless, you don't need to make forty five million dollars to have a good night. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, the yeah. lesson is learned, right? That that if yeah. it's premium and it's considered special, that then people are willing to pay for it. Um, a related question uh, is is around sort of pricing, right? For in in venue events, there was a sort of a automatic price differentiation model where you know you sort of took as much money off of the table from the consumer as you could by tearing out. Okay, front row, three rows in, and then you had the nosebleed seats, right? And so you had your venue size, you had obviously the constraints associated with that, but you maxed out your revenue, or at least tried to, yeah. StubHub proved you hadn't maxed it out because the ticket Good face point. price was, yeah. was 200 and it went for 2000 in the secondary market. But, but obviously there's PR issues to putting the face price at 2000 for, for front row seat. But I'm really more thinking about now that we're moving to sort of the hybridization um, and we're thinking about the sort of pay-per-view model of, of the, the virtual portion of the event, mm-hmm. right? How do you take that extra money off the table there, right? Because typically pay-per-view has been a price for that pay-per-view, right? And it's the same price for Billy Bob in his trailer park and for, you know, Michael Bloomberg sitting in his, in his mansion, right? They all paid the same price to watch that pay-per-view fight. And, and so how, how do you add value to create tiered ticket pricing in a, in a virtual environment? It can be done. I think it's less obvious than than an in-person event. And uh, I'm waiting for someone to suggest that the cheaper ticket buyers on an online event somehow see a farther away camera shot. That, that is not a good idea. I do not recommend that. <laughs> like all of a sudden your view is worse. Don't do that. That's dumb. Um, what we've seen is that there are um, there are ways of doing it that have more to do with the, the new kinds of interactivity that are possible. Right? So one of the things about a traditional pay-per-view is it's a thing on a screen, right? What's possible now with, with Stellar and with other, pl- other platforms, but especially with Stellar, is there's, there's ways to actually interact with what's happening. Um, and those can, be, those can be tiered, right? Those can be um, broken out in different ways. So, for example, you could pay to have uh, a, 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 ch- a private chat room that includes um the artist potentially if it depending on what you know you could have you could have something that there's there's a um a series right now called crossovers where we have brian stoke mitchell who's the, one of the greatest act, greatest broadway actors of all time hosting his friends who also happen to be great performers and there's a vip tier of the ticket where you're in a chat with vip but also your questions get potentially answered by the host as opposed to people not in the vip where they're chatting with each other but they're not chatting with brian um, there's things like that. There's also ways of, of adding value that, that are super interesting. So we, we, um, we had an event, uh, called watch with watch with Bruce Campbell, who's the star of the evil dead movies. You may, you may have heard of him. Great, great guy, great actor, uh, made the movies with Sam Raimi back in the eighties. And they've been like a franchise for, for 30 years or whatever. 
uh, one of the things that we did was we created a series of things that you could you could add on to the event, you know, signed poster, just different things. But the most important thing to say about that is the top tier, the, <laughs> which I was really kind of a like, let's see what happens. Um, we 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 added one ticket where you could buy a chainsaw or, you know, your ticket included a chainsaw that Bruce would sign during the event. So Bruce Campbell, you know, with a, a, a big silver Sharpie signed this chainsaw, you know, and, and then you, you were and he was like, and I want to just say uh, to Kevin Lee, who's our, our chainsaw, you know, tier customer, congratulations. Like, here he goes. And that was a $2,500 ticket. And it was not $2,500 worth of chainsaw. It was you know, sort of regular $300 chainsaw or whatever. We put it up and thinking like, will anyone do this? And within about two hours, somebody had bought it, right? right? So it's, it's and that kind of thing would be a lot harder to do in person, you know, frankly. I mean, you could do it, but it just lends itself much better to breaking people out and giving them some new way of interacting, some new way of being part of it online. So the creativity is the only limit there, I think. Yeah, and I think scarcity um, in particular, some, some people love that scarcity and bragging yeah. rights uh, which brings me to sort of my, my final question, which is, you know, uh, ha have they sort of cracked the code yet on NFTs and events? Like, the, does that sort of permanent digital, you know, the, the ticket itself could be an NFT or have a, have a um, could, could be issued in such a way that it's a smart contract, right? So it has its permanence. You could ac actually have elements of the show which are NFTable, right? Are, you know, if you can make it scarce enough and make it, you know, high perceived value, it could conceivably be an NFT, but it's sort of like the wild west in NFTs right now. So um, any thoughts on that? Have you, have you put any cycles into thinking that through? I've heard a lot of talk about it. <laughs> um, I think it's one of these things that um, there's so many other basic things that people aren't doing. Right. Like what I was talking about. That, that I feel like they hear the NFT. I'm not saying there's no value there because there obviously is, yeah. but but it's it's a little more remote. It's a little more kind of um, um, dicey, you know, to me, uh, unless you really know the space well and you know that the audience is the kind that'll, that'll be responsive to that, it's probably not the place to, in my opinion, it's not the place to focus for most people right now because... There's all these other ways of getting there, right? There's all these other just, I used to talk about this with uh, with ticket pricing where people wanted to dynamically price every ticket, you know, and like have some computer saying, make it instead of $16, make it $16 and 30 cents right now. And then, you know, the weather gets a little worse. And so now it's $16 and 10, and, and, and they weren't even, you know, pricing the difference between a Tuesday and a Saturday. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, do so, that because that definitely will work and you don't have to, you know, yeah. um, I think this is another one of those things where it's like, there's a lot of ways to increment the value and to, um, and to give people more. I think this is a key idea. Give the viewer more, right? Like if you have a fan, I, I talk about with online events that local doesn't matter as much, right? Because you can reach theoretically the whole world. Um, not quite true, but you can, you know, local doesn't matter with an in-person event. Local is, is absolutely crucial, right? With, with an online event, local doesn't matter as much, but enthusiastic matters more, right? So I, I'm, I bet you, you and I are the same on this. I will go to a live in-person show for something I'm sort of enthusiastic about because it, why not? Right. Generally with online events, you need someone whose threshold of enthusiasm is higher, yep. but you get to go anywhere in the world to find those people. Right. So you're talking about somebody who's interested in an exchange of, you know, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about this. So give me more and, and I will, you know, take a, take a step toward each other. And so for me, NFTs might work, but there's probably for most markets, for most audiences, for most artists, for most organizations, there's probably some more straightforward exchange of value things that can be done there. Maybe NFTs, you know, they're going to be certain people, you know, I, I bet that if you had, you know, um, an event that, that that was oriented toward, you know, young men who were do doing cryptocurrency, maybe NFTs would be a straightforward, you know, value proposition for them. For a lot of other people, it's just, 
isn't <laughs> at least not now. So yeah, yeah. But, but I still think you know the the whole idea is like give people something more and ask them for more in exchange, and you're onto something. Yeah, I think you know my takeaway from our conversation is really that you know one theme that that runs through the whole conversation is you know put put the very best quality event together that you can, and yes. don't cut don't cut the corners. Uh, just because it happens to be virtual or hybrid, uh, yeah. you know, if anything, go above and beyond because, you know, for the fence sitters uh, to get them to actually opt into an, a, a virtual ticket, right? It's probably going to have to be a smidge better or perceived as a smidge better. You, you can't just, you know, actually, and I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book about uh, a kind of primer for how to do online events well, that hopefully will be out at the beginning of the year. Um, it's in the publisher's hands now, but um, I talk a lot about this. Like you can't just point a camera at an event that's happening anyway and call it an online event. Um, this is what I call radio on television, right? So when television was invented, a lot of, there were, there were people who got it right. And there were people who did radio on television. They took their radio show and they kind of like pointed a camera at it, you know, and it wasn't very good, right? So um, there's there's a scene in I Love Lucy from 1952 that you've probably seen, that many people have seen the, when they're working in the candy factory. Have you seen Have you seen yeah. this scene? Yeah, and this is a great example of in 1952 they were Lucy and and Desi and and that group was not doing radio on television because what they were doing. Um, so just Google if you if you don't if you're not familiar just Google seen it many times <laughs> yeah yeah but you're you're whoever's listening right now just go Google like Lucy uh, Candy Factory you'll find it um, they couldn't have possibly done that on the radio right it wouldn't have been it wouldn't make sense um, so they were doing television and not radio on television I think sometimes right now I use that analogy because it's it's easy for people to understand but sometimes right now people are struggling with doing you know an in person event really it's not. Uh, an online event. It's an in-person event with a camera pointed at it. Um, and so that will get better. I, I'm convinced people will just get better at it, but it's important to think like we're composing something that's to, meant to be seen on the screen, right? And and to behave accordingly. Right. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for, for joining me, Jim. It was, it was great brainstorming about the future of events and in particular, the idea of hybrid or virtual only and where those could go. And uh, I, I enjoyed talking about the marketing opportunities that might arise as a result as well. I think that's going to be an area for a lot of innovation. So I think so too. Watching that. It's, a wide open, it's a wide open medium that I think over the next five years will go from where it is now, which is nascent to obvious. You know, It'll be amazing that people didn't leverage this sooner, but of course it always feels that way. <laughs> um, it, it, takes a, it takes time and, and people will get there, I believe. Absolutely. Lots of room for innovation and invention, what we yep. like. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. All right. Kevin Lee's Power Marketing is available on all your favorite podcast networks. Kevin loves helping businesses excel at marketing. Having marketing challenges? Just like Santa in the Miracle on 34th Street. If Kevin can't help you, he'll know someone who can. Find him on LinkedIn, subscribe, or follow. 